children are dismissed to Children's Church. I'm going to give you a quick update on a prayer request right quick. Jenny just got a text on Kim Shunk, and she's awake. So amen to that. So that song, uh, Revelation song, goes well with the picture and words that we're going to try and get to this morning, although we didn't coordinate about, uh, about any of this. So um, we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. I, I haven't done this kind of stuff in a long time where you just kind of take one verse, and, and I guess this time I've got two individual verses. Um, so let's, let's think for a minute. Are there books of the Bible that intimidate you? I mean, for some of us, some people really love the book of Romans, but I think there are some people that are intimidated by the book of Romans because of how, how Paul's thought just boom, boom, boom. I mean, he, he runs through places and just makes these transitions, and I'm just like, how did we get here, you know? Am I the only one? I'm in good company. All right, I'm the only one. Well, anyway, for me, for a bunch of years, the book of Hebrews was kind of intimidating. I felt like that there was just something there in all these pictures that I didn't understand very well. Um, it's a little mysterious, and it's maybe hard to understand because it, you really need a background and some things in the Old Testament to understand the book of Hebrews, or you need somebody to tell you, hey, here's the things that are going on, and this is where you can find it. Um, so while we were living in Alaska, this has been about three years ago now, I, for several weeks my devotions were reading through the book of Hebrews in several different translations, but also working my way through a commentary on the book of Hebrews that was published by InterVarsity, part of their The Bible Speaks Today series. And it was such a blessing for me. Um, but I've been thinking about the book of Hebrews recently, and um, this verse, chapter 2, verse 1, bothers me. So that verse says... Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. And I don't know what you, when you think about drifting, I mean, some of you have fished and you've done things where drifting was a good thing, right? Uh, that's not, this word is not being used in that, in that way here at all. Um, so it's a well, before we go there, let me, let me read you a couple of other things. Um, here's how J.B. Phillips says it. We ought, therefore, to pay the greatest attention to the truth that we have heard and not allow ourselves to drift away from it. So one of the things I hear in, this, in these verses, or this verse, is that you and I have a responsibility for our discipleship. Um, you know, the, the verse begins with a therefore, um, and it's because of the greatness of Christ that's, already, that's been pictured for us in chapter 1. I mean, when you see the word therefore, there's always stuff that goes prior. And so if you get a chance, you ought to go back and, you know, just, just read what chapter 1's all about, the, the supremacy of Jesus Christ over all things and how he's superior to the angels and all these other folks who have come along ahead of him, he's so much greater than but it's because of the greatness of Christ. And John Newton said this as an older man. He said, although my memory's fading, I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner. And Christ is a great Savior. I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. That's why I think in 1 Timothy 1.16, the Apostle Paul makes the comment about how Christ came to save sinners of whom I am chief, or depending on the translation you've got, I'm the worst, right? Uh, and I'll own that. Because I know that nobody's sin but my own separates me from the Lord, right? So in that sense, all of us would have to lay claim to the fact, I am a great sinner, and I am in need of a great salvation, and there is a great Savior who's come to offer that salvation. 
Um, if you want to think about it this way, the book of Hebrews, this is a sentence I tried to write, we'll see how what you think, is a book about a great salvation and a great Savior who is also our great high priest who's made possible a great rescue, a great redemption that will lead ultimately to a great consummation. Because it's not just about this life. So, this word drift has to do with the idea of you're just kind of things are flowing past or gliding by without giving heed to things. I was going to warn you, I take, I take, I've got five pages of notes. It takes me about an hour to work my way through a page. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe. Um, but this drift, I drift drift, so like to, to let things slip away carelessly or with carelessness, not paying attention to things important. It might be used in, the, in a sentence like, for example, to let a ring slip off the finger and to be lost. Or to let the water in a cracked jar just seep away. Or if you especially want to think about drier climates, to have a cistern that's cracked that can't hold the water and it seeps away. And so it's not there when they need it, right? Um, it could be the, used with the idea of to let, have, let something slip from memory. It also could be about a crumb that goes down the wrong way or a river escaping its channel. It's a word for the 102. But, um, you know, so <clears throat> in the revised version, it said, lest happily we drift away from them. And when it says happily, it's not happily like we're joyous, right? It's, but just this, in, in a sense, a sloppiness, right? Let them slip is from the authorized version. But the figure is that of a ship drifting past safe anchorage, and believers are to take heed lest adverse doctrines sweep them away from their Christian convictions. Now, I borrowed that from a note in the Spirit-Filled Life Bible. But my question, that I, what I question what was written there, because there is some thought here in the book of Hebrews. It's not only about what people believe and what they're going to do with it, but it's also about the fact that these believers that this book is written to, many of them have encountered some adverse circumstances. And they are in danger of drifting. Because there's pressure on them. And um, I think one of the reasons I, I feel very strongly about this word and this verse is just I... This book's for us. We're not Jewish Christians, you know, all, as far as I know, we're all, we were all good Gentiles, right? As good as Gentiles can be. Um, but we are a people who are under pressure, and we are going to experience increasing pressure in the days ahead. You see it in the political climate, and I'm not here to, to do any of that. I'll just tell you, tell you this, one of my favorite authors from years ago, Tom Skinner, um, who was uh, the head of his uh, gang in New York City, as well as the president of his youth group. I don't know how that works out. I guess you just change jackets when you go into church, right? But he said this. He wrote a book uh, a number of years later because he had become a Christian. His faith was very important to him. And he said, Jesus Christ is neither Republican or Democrat. He did not come to take sides. He came to take over. All right? And that's true for all of us. That we're labeled first as his. You know, I... I don't know what the future holds for my boys, you know, but in their, in their discipleship, I want Jesus Christ to be first in their life. And I want them to guard their hearts lest they drift. Well, so <clears throat> we've been doing the blessing of the hands at Maryville at the hospital. Uh, May is Nurses Month, and then there's a week that's designated as Nurses Week, and in the midst of Nurses Week is Nurses Day. But there's a tradition in many hospitals about blessing the hands. And so we have this short script that we're using about we recognize all the things that their hand, you know, these are hands that have touched pain or that have touched lives and cared for people in pain. Um, they're hands that hold, hold hands to express hope. And we, we've got this thing we go through. And I've been going in early last week to try and catch some of the nurses who wouldn't be able to come to the other times, the scheduled times when we did that. And I had a nurse... Good Baptist said, oh, you're in early. And all of a sudden she said, do you believe in once saved, always saved? Well, what do you do when a Baptist asks you that? 
So I'll tell you about it in just a second. But anyway, 1 John 5, 21. John, at the, it's, the, it's the last verse of this little short letter, five chapters of 1 John. He says, and the English, the English Standard Version says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Um, other translations might say, instead of saying little children, might say, my dear children. Because it's meant to be a term of, com- of affection. Um, J.B. Phillips says, be, but be on your guard, my dear children, against every false god. So think with me for a moment about idols, because we can drift toward idols. So what are some characteristics of idols? Well, one is that idols tend to be attractive. There's something about them that appeals to us. Whether it's the thing that if I, you know, for in ancient times, at least when people worship certain gods, maybe they thought that Maybe the statue wasn't much to look at, but they thought somehow they could manipulate the God who was behind the statue by the offering of their sacrifices. And in that sense, it was attractive to them. If I just do this, then we're going to get rain. If I just do this, we're going to have great crops, right? Um, So another thing about idols is that they are readily available. They're at least, they may be cheaper than a dime a dozen. But one thing you need to know about idols is that they, they demand your ad- attention. And a second thing you need to know about idols is that they demand sacrifices. And the third thing, especially that you need to know, is that idols make promises that they cannot keep. So idols can be our stuff. It could be our hobbies. When we were living at uh, just outside of Fort Knox and we were stationed there for the two and a half years, Levi... Our oldest boy worked at a golf course on the grounds crew. And he really enjoyed being outside. And he was enjoying run, running these great big ZTRs and doing all these things, right? And just having a great time. But there was an older man whose last name was Bauman who would show up every morning about 7.30 if the weather was decent. And he'd play this hole of golf. And then he'd go over here and he'd play a different hole. He never did, played them in order. He'd just do whatever. And then he'd stop and he'd dig around in, the, in all the water holes for golf, golf balls with his little, you know, thing. And then he might go down along, you know, a ditch and look for golf balls and then he'd play another hole. But he would spend hours out there. And I don't know if Mr. Bauman uh, claimed to be a Christian or not, but I would tell him as a retiree, you're wasting, you're wasting your time if all you've got to do is play golf. Not, no offense to anybody that likes to golf, go have a good time. But just to go out and just park on the golf course for hours and hours every day, I think he had made an idol out of it. Just, or if golf itself wasn't the idol, just doing his own thing was his idol. Maybe he thought, you know, I've worked hard, I can retire, I can just sit back and take it easy. There's good scripture about that in the Gospel of Luke, right? About the rich man and his barns. What did the Lord call that rich man? You fool. And Mr. Bauman's not here to defend himself, so I don't want to beat up on him anymore. But I use him as that because it it just frustrated Levi so much just to watch how this guy just frittered away his hours out at the golf course. Um, So I want to suggest, just real quick, and this is kind of a rabbit trail, and I don't want to go very far down it, but I think it's possible that some people have doctrines that are like idols in their lives. So I do believe in the eternal security of the believer. I think that's a better way to state it than just this once saved, always saved, okay? When this nurse friend brought this up, she was talking to me then about her sister. And so this friend of mine who's a nurse, she and her husband, they're both pretty close to my age. They've been around the block a time or two, right? And they've been part of the Baptist church for a long, long time. But she was telling me how her sister had uh, gone forward and prayed a prayer to accept Jesus when she was in, Janu- in uh, junior high. And she's, probably been ba- and she's almost the same age as my nurse friend. And she's probably been back to church about five times then over the course of her adult life. And she wanted to know if I thought she was saved. <clears throat> and I told her I had my doubts. Because I don't know that that prayer was really genuine. You know, John the Baptist told the the folks that came to him to be baptized, he said, bring forth fruit 
in keeping with repentance. Now, I'm not here to beat that lady up either, but here's what I'd like you to think about. There are some people, for example, who are more in love with a doctrine, like they, they get, can get so excited about once saved, always saved, that they might like that doctrine more than they would like the God who saves them. It's possible to be more enamored with mercy than it is to be enamored with a God of mercy. Because that'll just let you off the hook. But what about the God of mercy? What's he like? Because he's also holy. You know, I was, so I've got some songs for you this week. Got it, right, right? One of them is the song, He Leadeth Me. O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort fraught. That's not a word you use very much anymore, but it's the idea that it's filled, right? And this, uh, but he leadeth me. By his own hand he leadeth me. Where'er I go, where'er I be, still tis my God that leadeth me. A doctrine can't lead you like that. An idol can't take your hand and take you down the trail. And an idol can't see you through tough times. There's a God that will lead us, right? Um, or the other, one of the other hymns that came to mind for me this week was uh, the hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. I listened to a, a group do it. It was supposed to be some sort of modern worship thing, and I noticed they conveniently left out the verse that talked about uh, our awareness of our sin. But I love the image there of all the saints adore thee, Casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim. Heavenly beings that are awesome in might and power. That's a parenthetical, right? That's not part of the verse. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee. Who wert and art and evermore shall be. That's the God we have to do with. So, um, go back to 1 John 5, 21 for just a second, then there's a way to think about it, and that's just, we don't want to allow anything to even slightly lessen our worship, our service, or our devotion to God. And I just would, you know, it's just just challenging at times to to be sure of, you know, am, am I just liking this thing about God, or am I really in love with God himself? So... 1 Timothy 4.16 says, Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Um, In the NIV it says, Watch your life and doctrine closely. Because people that have made a doctrine into an idol, that that thing doesn't necessarily really shape their life. Now, if I'm going to go around and get bold, for example, and say, I am eternally secure in Christ, that ought to be shaping something in me. Because I'm in Christ, you know. And one of these days, you know, what does 1 John chapter 3 talk about? That if we have this hope in us, we purify ourselves as he himself is pure. Because one day, we shall see him. And we shall be like him. You know, I don't want to be the... When I was talking to the, to the nurse, the one thought I had was just, you know, well, the scripture does talk about those, that you know, there's this judgment of our works. And... There's gold and silver and all these things, and then there's wood, hay, and stubble, and it's all going to be consumed, and some of it will not survive that. But I don't want to be the person standing there in the smoky robe. So, A key to the ideas that are here, though, in the book of Hebrews, now going back, so we're not going to allow an idol to cause us to drift, is the idea that we have to persevere. Calls, you know, there's places in the scripture that calls for the endurance of the saints. That's a theme in the book of Revelation. So just walk with me for a minute. I wanna, what I want to do is just read you a series of scriptures that come from the book of Hebrews. We're going to cover most of the chapters, but they're going to give us some idea about how we do this. So chapter 3, verse 1 says, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. Um, J.B. Phillips says, I want you to think of the messenger and high priest of the faith we hold, Christ Jesus. And that word that's translated consider means to fix your eyes or to fix your mind on one thing, 
to give it attention and continuous observation. And in many ways, what it means is you're going to shift your focus from over here and you're going to lock it down over here, right? You're going to take it off these circumstances and you're going to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to take it off all this mess and, you're, and not that the mess goes away because it doesn't, right? But maybe by considering him, maybe then I know what to do and how to live in the midst of the mess. Chapter 3, verse 12, so a few verses there, it says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Verse 14, For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence in Him. And it has to do with an idea of assurance and conviction. Um, you know, um, Winston Churchill was not a Christian. But he, said, he had one little speech that you ought to all hang on to, right? The time he got on the radio there in World War II and just said, never, never, never give up. And that's, that's kind of what these verses are getting at. Just grab a hold, you know, be like a bulldog. Get a hold of something let, don't let it, and don't let it go. Verse four, or chapter 4, verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession or to hold to, firmly to our faith. And I want to suggest to you that it's not just, to, and not just enough to hold on to some words. You know, like, for example, if you can recite the Apostles' Creed. But it's all those things that 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 creed points you to and ultimately the one to whom you, you are declaring allegiance when you, when you recite that creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, right? And you go on through that and you're declaring these statements about faith. But if it's just words, it's one thing. If it's, if it's some sort of confession. But if it takes you right into relationship with God, that's a whole other deal. And there's power in it. Chapter 6, verse 9. Now, right before this is where it's talked about all these things that, you know, we need to kind of get past certain basic doctrines and advance, be, be a maturing in our faith. And there's a, a context here that's really important. But it says, so there's, he's been kind of rough with them, the writer. Because he's just compared them to, he's, or he suggested the possibility, like you have ground that produces good crops, and you have ground that doesn't do much, it produces thorns and thistles, and you ought to just burn it off. And then he says, though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown in His name and serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish. Now that's the English Standard Version. But imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. J.B. Phillips translates that verse, We do not any one of you to grow slack but to follow the example of those who through sheer, patient faith came to possess the promises. Remember Jacob and the angel? Let me go, the angel says after they've wrestled all night. And what does Jacob say? Not until you bless me. So... There's a picture there in words, I think, for us to grab on, right? Don't let go. That idea about being sluggish, though, or to grow slack. I mean, we'd say, you know, we'd mess with people when, when I was in the Army. Listen to somebody talk about something, you go, ah, slackers. And Sally, I don't want to cause any offense, but those of us at Joint Base Elmendorf Richardson on the green side often said that about the blue side. Just so you yes, ma'am. <laughs> Air Force slackers, right? So, um, but, it, but ha a, to go slack means to get lazy. You're not investing effort into it. 
And discipleship does demand some effort from us. It's not just all about us and our effort, but it does involve an investment on our part. I mean, I got a whole shelf full of Bibles at my house. And many of my kids have a good shelf going. Because they've, they've, the, over the last year, they've ordered all sorts of neat stuff. But you, you, know, you can sit in the same room with the Bible. You can stare at that shelf. And none of it's getting into your heart until you crack one of them open and start reading. And ask the Lord, help me understand this. Plant it in my soul. All right, so there, there's a part of it that does demand something from us. Uh, chapter 7, verse 25 Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Another translation says, this means that he can save fully and completely those who approach God through him, for he is always living to intercede on their behalf. But just that idea that that salvation is meant to be full and complete, it's not just for this life, it's not just for time, it's also for eternity. Hang on to it. Um, Chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast. Chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. J.B. Phillips right, translates it this way. In this confidence let us hold on to the hope that we profess without the slightest hesitation. For he is utterly dependable. Now remember the, the writer of the book of Hebrews, and we don't really know who did this. Um, you know for a long time there were people who thought Paul, and I don't think Paul wrote it doesn't quite match up with his writing style. There's lots of good reasons to believe that Paul's not the guy that wrote it. Some people think, uh, you know, they've got different ones. Maybe maybe Silas or Silvanus, who was Paul's amanuensis. That's a nice big word for you. It has to do with the idea that he was the one that scribed out Paul's letters, that he might have had something to, to, to write here. But whoever wrote it is trying to remind these people in the midst of hard times, hang on. Hang on. Chapter 10, verses 35 and 36. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. And so when it talks about don't throw away your confidence, it has this idea of this endurance. There's, there's two ways you can think about endurance. There's some people that just go like, okay, well, I guess I'll just keep going on. Kind of this just resignation. But uh, what if the idea here is I endure because I have this blazing hope? I have a a fire that's been kindled in my soul. So let me read a, a larger piece here in context. This is again, I, I really like J.B. Phillips, his uh, New Testament modern English, although I guess it was back in the 60s, so now it's not quite such, cont- or maybe even in the 50s, I don't know. But it uh, could be older than that. It's older than me, let's put it that way. But he said, you must never forget those past days when you had received the light and went through such a great and painful struggle. It was partly because everyone's eye was on you that you endured harsh words and harsh, hard experiences. Partly because you threw in your lot with those who suffered much the same. You sympathized with those who were put in prison and you were cheerful when your own goods were confiscated. So he's talking to some people who have known some persecution. For you knew that you had a much more solid and lasting treasure in heaven. Don't throw away your trust now. It carries with it a rich reward in the world to come. Patient endurance is what you need if, after doing God's will, you are to receive what he has promised. 
For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. Verse 39, chapter 10. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Where Philip says, we're not going to be men who cower back and are lost, but men who maintain their faith until the salvation of their souls is complete. Um, one of the ways you could think about this, this verse, chapter 10, verse 39, if you were write a sentence about it, is just, we don't belong to the timid. Well, Roberts University, you know, every, every wing... Every floor within a dorm has their own little t-shirt. and You have to wear it for intramurals, right? So one year I was part of New Blood, and then I was part of this, that, or some other thing. One year I was part of Unity, and we had our cool little shirts. If anybody tries to sell you a shirt that says, Timid across the front, say, oh no. There's probably a stronger way to say it, but that's good enough, right? Oh no. That's not, what I'm, that's not who I'm called to be. That's not the people I'm called to be a part of. Chapter 12, and we're almost done. Chapter 12, we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Chapter, or verse 2, looking to Jesus. Now, some translations might say, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, right? The NIV, I think, says it that way. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And this is, again, this is that idea with this looking to Jesus, that I'm, I'm taking my focus from whatever this mess is over here, and I'm going to put it on my Savior. Consider him... This is verse 3, consider him. And this is a different word than what we found back in chapter 3, verse 1. This has to do almost like with to meditate on it. And you understand that the idea of meditation within a Christian tradition is to kind of fix your mind on something. And that, it has to do with focus. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything about just trying to empty yourself like some Eastern kind of thing. That opens up all sorts of doors that you don't want to walk through. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. So let me read it to you from Phillips, and then I've got th three things we can do to apply this, okay? Surrounded then as we are by these serried ranks of witnesses. That's a very British way to say it, I think. Let us strip off everything that hinders us as well as the sin which dogs our feet. And let us run the race that we have to run with patience, our eyes fixed on Jesus, the source and goal of our faith. For he himself endured a cross and thought nothing of its shame because of the joy he knew would follow his suffering. And he is now seated at the right hand of God's throne. Think constantly of him, enduring all that sinful men could say against him, and you will not lose your purpose or your courage. And the idea in chapter 12, verse 3, is by keeping my thoughts and my attention focused his way, I'll be encouraged to keep on keeping on in the midst of all the mess. Okay, so, gosh, we're, we're several hours ahead of where I thought we'd be for our stopping time, right? Um, so what does all this mean? I think there are three things it means. So if we go back to the, the I think about the idols for a minute, what that means is if there's an idol in your life, confess it and forsake it. Pretty simple to say, maybe hard to do, but that's the word to us about our idols. Confess it and forsake it. Because again, it's going to make promises it can never keep. It'll demand sacrifices that you don't want to make. The second thing is to seek earnestly and to seek and to keep on seeking. And along the way, 
beware of substitutes. So what do you know about hummingbirds? They are like, the word would be, uh, I think they're dipsomaniacs. You can use the same word for an alcoholic, but they just have this thirst that is unsatiable, or insatiable, excuse me, insatiable. And um, when we were down at Fort Leonard Wood, our installation chaplain and his wife, she was from Tennessee. She wore these big orange tennis shoes with a T on them. We always called them her clown shoes. We loved her, but we did like picking on her. But anyway, Ann Watson put out a hummingbird feeder, and she'd have as many as 13 or 14 of them buzzing around by her house. It was just amazing. But over time, she got a little frustrated with having to buy the stuff, like at the commissary, to, you know, just to refill the thing. And so she'd be in, she went looking for a recipe. And one of the things that, that she talked to us about one evening, we were over there watching them, because they were just beautiful. It was, fun, it was fun to watch them, was how, as she looked at this one internet site that talked about how you'd mix up the sugar water and what you'd do, then there was a note, a warning not to use artificial sweeteners, right? They taste sweet. There's no calories. Poor little bird can drink itself to death and die because there's not calories to sustain it. And uh, I just thought that was a great picture of the idea there are all sorts of things that might kind of, if you will, taste good to us that will not satisfy our spiritual hungers. And they will not sustain us when hard times come. So beware of substitutes. And then the last word is pretty simple. It's just, they don't say it this way exactly in the book of Hebrews. It talks about endurance. It talks about perseverance. But ultimately, it just, I think it comes down, trust believers, as hang on. Hang on. Would you pray with me? Lord, you've called us to yourself, and we rejoice in that. We thank you for your great love and for your mercy. And we pray, Lord, uh, we've got a couple of petitions, Lord. One is just if there are things that have gotten in the way in our discipleship that prevent us from really just embracing you and following you, if we have idols in our lives, give us grace today to recognize them and then strength to confess them and to forsake them. And then, Lord, just stir up within us by the strength that you provide, by the power and comfort and encouragement of your Holy Spirit. Give us grace, Lord, just to, to hang on to you and walk with you in faithfulness. Renew us in your love. And then, Lord, just draw us into this relationship where, where in all things we might be able to honor you and serve you well. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Sit at the table, come.
come taste the grace and rest for the weary rest that endures earth has no sorrow that never came so lay down your burdens lay down your